Um, but it's great to see everybody today. Thank you. This is the, the kickoff lecture for our four-part Zoom at noon series. So um, this Thursday and then every Thursday for the next several weeks, we've got four of these talks. And we're really focusing on um, Carolina, the first 50 years. Um, so we're coming at it from a lot, a number of different perspectives. Um, uh, John, uh, today, John Hyde is going to kind of kick us off with how did we get here? How did we get started? Um, and kind of creating Carolina. So um, I want to tell you a little bit about John Hyatt. Every time I go out to Charlestown Landing, I'm always so excited to get a tour from him because he's so knowledgeable. If you ever um, have a group, um, try and get uh, hooked up with John. I learn something every time I go out there. We have a um, the Powder Magazine and the Dames uh, put on a Colonial Charleston Teacher Institute every year. And I literally learn something a lot every year from John. He is the lead interpretive ranger uh, at park historian at Charlestown Landing. Um, he has a bachelor's and a master's degree in history from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Um, and he's got over 20 years experience in public history. Um, he has been a frontline interpreter at different historic sites um, following graduate school and an internship with the National Park Service. He went into business as an independent preservation planner uh, and a research historian. Um, he joined the staff at Charlestown Landing in 2006. And that's really the time period um, uh, around the time period where they're really kind of redoing everything. And, and John was a part of that re-envisioning re of um, Charlestown Landing as well. Back a million years ago, I worked for Charlestown Landing, but it was the, the 1970s um, version <laughs> of Charlestown Landing. It's completely different now. And it's, it's so great. And a lot of that's due to John's expertise. Um, if one more time, if you're just joining us and if you're a guide uh, seeking recertification, continuing education credits, just put your name in the chat and I will make sure that you get guide credits today. And I'll check in at the end as well. But for right now, I think we'll turn it over to John Hyatt. Thanks for being here, John. Well, thank you, Catherine. Thank you for that kind introduction. And thanks to everyone for devoting a perfectly serviceable lunch hour to, uh, to listen to a discussion on early proprietary history. So this talk uh, really explores the turbulent time period that produced England's Carolina colony and also chronicles the events that led up to the founding of the first permanent settlement of European origin in what is now South Carolina. So geography and history are, of course, inextricably linked. Uh, this connection is often manifested in the names that people choose for places and geographic features. Such names are windows to the past. And looking at a map of the Carolinas, we see names associated with their very origins uh, back when they were part of the English colony of Carolina. In South Carolina, there are the counties named Berkeley, Clarendon, and Colleton. The rivers framing the downtown Charleston Peninsula are the Ashley and Cooper. Moving north, we find Craven and Carteret counties, as well as Albemarle Sound. These units of local government and bodies of water are obviously named after the eight men upon whom King Charles II conferred the Carolina Charter back in the year 1663. They were its original proprietors. And while they were successful in getting the colony up and running, their successors struggled to maintain a stable polity and proprietary mismanagement, of course, sparked intense resentment. Uh, so much so that uh, tensions had reached such a boiling point in the year 1719 that uh, a faction of disaffected colonists overthrew the proprietary government in a bloodless coup, convincing royal officials that both uh, South and North Carolina, which had become separate provinces back in the year 1712, uh, should be brought under the Crown's provisional control. 
And in 1729, after years of negotiations, George II purchased seven of the eight proprietary shares, officially turning South and most of North Carolina into royal provinces. Now that arrangement uh, would come crashing down less than 50 years later when both provinces declared their independence from Great Britain. So curiously, the origins of the Carolinas are, are indirectly tied to another revolution and counter-revolution, uh, one that convulsed England in the mid 1600s, pitting royalists against Republican in a bloody civil war. These English civil wars erupted out of a political power struggle between King Charles I and Parliament. And while they were the product of many colossal egos, uh, the one that cast the biggest shadow, it could be argued, belonged to the king himself. Charles I was an ardent proponent of the divine right of kings, and he bitterly resented the constitutional constraints on his royal prerogative and attempted to rule without Parliament, rather unsuccessfully. And conversely, Parliament chafed at the Crown's attempt to usurp its legal authority and sought to further humble, humble the crown. So this crisis also boiled over uh, into open hostilities uh, after the king ordered the arrest of five members of the opposition in January of 1642. Well, Charles I and his supporters not only lost the English Civil Wars, the king would end up losing his head. Uh, he was captured and later put on trial for treason and behaved so arrogantly during the proceedings that the high court resolved to execute, quote, that man of blood, unquote, as his enemies called him. Uh, his public beheading would take place outside of the royal palace in London in January 1649. Following his execution, his 18-year-old son, Charles II, was declared King of Scotland, uh, which was a separate sovereign nation from England at the time, although both uh, the House of Stuart had ruled them both. And uh, meanwhile, uh, Parliament abolished the monarchy and converted England into a republic, the Commonwealth. Uh, Charles II raised an army and invaded Northern England in 1651, hoping to resecure the English throne. Uh, Oliver Cromwell's parliamentary forces, however, routed the Scottish troops and young Charles barely escaped with his life. Uh, he eventually made it to the continent where he would spend the next eight years in exile, uh, many of them in uh, modern day Bruges, which is in uh, modern day Belgium. And so in 1653, Oliver Cromwell emerges as the Lord Protector or head of state of the English Republic. His rule devolved into a dictatorship as he dissolved unwieldy parliaments, imposed military governors over the King's regions, and enacted a series of morality laws to regulate people's behavior. And here we see the Protectorate's coat of arms, which includes the, the rather paradoxical motto, Pax Quired or Bello, or peace is sought through war. Cromwell died in 1658, likely of a deadly combination of typhoid fever and malaria. And per his instructions, his son, Richard inherited the office of Lord Protector. Richard lacked his father's charisma and political acumen and was forced to abdicate in May of 1659 before even completing one full year of rule. Parliament then attempted to govern, or to govern the Commonwealth without a designated head of state. After a cabal of army grandees staged a coup, General George Monk, who had been one of Cromwell's trusted lieutenants and was serving as the military governor of Scotland, prepared to march his army into England in support of Parliament. The coup failed, but Parliament still invited Monk to bring his troops to the capital for its protection. Arriving in early February of 1660, Monk stabilized the volatile situation, but was unable to see a way forward that would not end in more uh, machinations or more bloodshed. So he reluctantly entered into secret negotiations with Charles II, who had been trying to woo him for several years. Now, another man of parliament and monk ally, Sir Anthony Ashley Cooper did the same. Uh, new elections would install a pro-royalist parliament, the convention parliament, which proclaimed Charles II king 
in April of 1660. So the new monarch timed his triumphant arrival in London to coincide with his 30th birthday. Uh, that would be May 29th of 1660. His official coordination would take place um, in April of the following year. So for his efforts, Monk, who was credited as the chief architect of the Stuart Restoration, was elevated to the peerage as Duke of Albemarle and was also made Captain General of England's Armed Forces. Anthony Ashley Cooper was also made a peer, but he came in at the entry level as Baron of Wimborne St. Giles. Of course, he would later earn himself an earldom, becoming the first Earl of Shaftesbury in 1672. So two years after the, the restoration of the House of Stuart to the throne of England, Monk and Ashley joined with people who would have been their enemies previously, uh, six other well-connected English nobles, all of whom had supported the royalist cause during the English Civil Wars. And together, this group formed a business partnership and sought a charter from the king to establish a new colony south of Virginia. Now, unfortunately, the historical record does not document definitively just who came up with the idea of Carolina. Yet historians citing circumstantial evidence have, have long conjectured that Carolina was the brainchild of Sir John Colleton, a wealthy planter living on the West Indian island of Barbados. As the traditional narrative goes, Colleton conceived the idea in hopes of relieving some of the pressures on the over crowded island, which was in the midst of a sugar boom, by giving its surplus English population a place to start anew. Uh, Colleton was a distant relative of George Monk, and he had fought for Charles I during the English Civil Wars, but it ended up immigrating to Barbados because Barbados was a royalist bastion or became a royalist bastion after King Charles I was executed. Uh, Charles II made Colleton a baronet or a hereditary knight as a reward for his service, and Colleton would serve as the first treasurer of the Carolina proprietorship. So here we see the portraits of the eight proprietors with the exception of Colleton. Either he never set for one or it has not survived. So let's take a closer look at the other members of the partnership. So briefly, George Monk, as we've already discussed, uh, as a Duke, he was the highest ranking member of the proprietorship, uh, and he took an active role in the beginning, uh, hosting many of the initial meetings at the cockpit, which were his private apartments in the King's Whitehall Palace. Now, these two portraits at the bottom middle, they're a little smaller than the others, and that's because these men were no longer involved with the proprietorship when the first successful fleet launched in August of 1669. So Edward Hyde, the Earl of Clarendon, uh, though outranked by Monk in the peerage, was the most politically powerful member of the group. Uh, he had served as Charles II's principal advisor and confidant during the interregnum while Charles was in exile continued in that capacity, serving the new king as England's high chancellor. Clarendon, however, never really showed much of an interest in Carolina and failed to contribute his share of the funds for the colony's startup costs. Uh, he would attend few of the initial meetings, perhaps because of his deep personal antipathy to another member, John Berkeley, <laughs> who reciprocated his contempt. Um, so, Clarendon would eventually fall from grace and would flee from England in 1667, and we'll, we'll see uh, why that happened a little bit later in the, in the presentation. Uh, next, we have Sir William Berkeley. Uh, he was the older of the two Berkeley brothers that were in the proprietorship, uh, and he had been knighted by Charles I. He was serving as the governor of Virginia at the time of the Carolina colonies chartering, and his interest in the province was was really only short-lived and dealt mainly with Albemarle County, which was a separate administrative unit of the Carolina colony just south of the Virginia border. John Berkeley, William's brother, uh, the Baron Berkeley, Baron Berkeley of Stratton, as he was known, was an active member in good standing when the first fleet sailed from England in 1669. He had fought for the Stuarts and had followed Charles II's entourage into exile on the continent. 
uh, where he was awarded a barony in 1658, a title that the king made official after the restoration. We also have William Craven. Uh, William Craven maintained his involvement with the proprietorship. Uh, previously a baron, Charles II elevated him to the status of Earl for his financial support of the Stuart family during the English Civil Wars. Sir George, Sir, Sir George, that's easy to say, Sir George Carteret. Uh, he had served as a naval officer and Lieutenant Governor of Jersey Island in the English Channel uh, during the conflict between King and Parliament. Uh, Carteret made Jersey a royalist stronghold and privateered for the monarchy during the wars uh, and earned himself a hereditary knighthood uh, from King Charles I during the Civil Wars in uh, 1605. He would also shelter Charles II on Jersey after the latter's defeat at Worcester in 1651. And Carteret likely was the man who wrote the petition, uh, wrote the petition that requested the Carolina Charter from the King in 1662. All right, so finally that brings us to Baron Anthony Ashley Cooper or Lord Ashley. Uh, he was serving as the Chancellor of the Exchequer, making him England's chief financial, financial officer at the time of the Carolina Charter. Uh, he would eventually emerge as the CEO of the proprietorship and would be its most dedicated member. So the Carolina Charter passed the seals in March 1663. Charles II authorized its recipients to establish a colony in parts of America yet uncultivated or planted by another European nation, granting them the title to the land between 36 degrees north latitude and 31 degrees north latitude. So it actually stretched all the way to the South Seas, to the Pacific Ocean. So it was a preposterously large land grant and a vast swath of Southern North America. Its physical settlement, of course, would be restricted to the uh, Eastern seaboard, however, during the colonial period. But diplomatically speaking, this charter was an affront to one of England's biggest rivals, Spain. Spain already laid claim to the region and even had outposts on the Georgia Sea Islands. So why did the English fail to respect Spain's claim? While England and Spain shared a technological and ecological heritage, they both had ocean-going vessels, gunpowder weapons, and diseases born of domesticated animals, they diverged significantly in matters of culture, especially regarding the proper protocol for establishing possession of land. Spain asserted its dominion over the Southeast with legal arguments based on the right of first discovery and exploration. And while the English would make some noise about discovery and exploration, they really found these arguments somewhat culturally unconvincing, uh, contending instead that a country must demonstrate a clear act of possession by not only physically occupying the land, but also improving the land through agriculture. Only after you didn't improve the land could you make it officially yours, could you establish that legitimate title. So it should come as no surprise that the proprietors of the Carolina colony chose the motto, Domitus cult oribus orbis, which means tamed by the cultivators of the earth. So let's take a closer look at the Carolina Charter. Uh, we'll start with the executive. The Crown gave the colony's proprietors expansive plenary powers as encapsulated in the Charter's Bishop of Durham Clause. So this clause enabled them to have, use, and exercise their province in, quote, as ample manner as any Bishop of Durham, unquote, end quote, had before. So the County Palatine of Durham was located on the border of Scotland. And during the medieval period, English monarchs endowed its bishops with king-like powers over church and state so that they could protect the realm from potential Scottish incursions. Carolina too would be a frontier province situated on the edge of England's mainland empire with a rival colonial power, Spain firmly entrenched in Florida to the south. Now, the Bishop of Durham clause clearly reflected this geopolitical reality. 
onto the legislative, the king also empowered the proprietors uh, with the power to ordain, make, and enact any laws whatsoever regarding both the public and private spheres, providing they did so with the advice and consent of the colony's freemen, and also ensured that they were reasonable and did not violate of the judicial. They were empowered to enforce laws. They were permitted to establish courts and appoint judges. The king also gave them the right to impose capital punishment, as well as to issue par pardons. So the charter contains several additional provisions. Uh, first, the Church of England was to be established as the colony's religion. Uh, but the king also encouraged the proprietors to grant their subjects indulgences and dispensations to practice their own religion so long as they proclaimed fealty to the English monarch. Second, the charter gave its grantees and their colonial representatives the authority to levy, muster, and train all sorts of men and to make war and pursue their enemies by sea as by land, even beyond the limits of this province. So not only could they make war, but they could do so, they could engage in offensive operations outside of the colony's borders if they thought it necessary for, for its security. And finally, Charles II permitted the proprietors to bestow marks of honor and favor meaning that they could establish a provincial nobility as long as they used titles that were different from those used in England. So while Charles II granted the Carolina colony as a debt of gratitude to those eight English nobles who helped support him and earn him the throne, he also stood to gain from it. Um, if the colony became a successful producer of semi-tropical or tropical commodities, uh, cash crops, and it was no surprise that the proprietors had intended to organize the colony's economy around staple agriculture, uh, then the king stood to pro profit and profit handsomely. Uh, without taking on any financial risk, uh, Charles could earn revenue from the customs duties imposed on Carolina commodities and revenue generated from such import taxes constituted a significant percentage of the Crown's annual income. So the first overseas impetus to settle in Carolina came from the sugar stain, the, excuse me, the sugar cane studded dystopia in the West Indies known as Barbados. The sugar industry had helped transform the small island into the, into the most densely populated and widely developed uh, region in the English Atlantic world outside of London. Uh, it had also made it the wealthiest colony in England's New World possessions. Uh, but for all of its affluence, Barbados was also a land of, of glaring inequities and brutality. In 1660, the island, which only encompasses about 160 uh, square miles, so you could fit five Barbadoses in modern day Charleston County, uh, it contained a population of about 53,000 people, of which 51% were enslaved. So by the end of the decade, uh, this black majority would reach a two to one ratio. Uh, the sugar boom, which began in earnest in Barbados in the mid 1640s, uh, did not actually bring plantation agriculture or African slavery to Barbados. This had started earlier when the island had a more diversified mixed export economy based on the production of minor staples, such as tobacco, cotton, indigo, uh, even ginger root. Uh, what the sugar boom did was intensify and amplify a process, accelerate a process that was already underway. So about five months after the Carolina colonies chartering, a group styling itself the Corporation of Barbados Adventurers appro approached the proprietors with a proposition to plant a new settlement in the province. Uh, this group also hired uh, the popular mariner, Captain William Hilton, after whom Hilton had his named, to chart the coast of Carolina and report on its geography. Now, early on in the, in the negotiations, the corporation split into two factions, one that favored settling on the Cape Fear River near modern-day Wilmington, North Carolina, and the other that preferred a location farther to the south. 
uh, while, while the proprietors would end up backing the latter faction that uh, preferred the southern location, the pro-Cape Fear faction had already launched an expedition, um, and they founded a settlement called Charlestown, believe it or not, um, in May of 1664. This was the first Charlestown. Uh, the, Bar the Barbadians quickly expanded upstream from Charlestown on the Cape Fear, and by 1666, the Cape Fear settlements reportedly uh, comprised several hundred people, some of which or some of whom were likely enslaved Africans. Meanwhile, uh, Charles II had increased the size of the Carolina Grant through a second patent issued in June 1665. This new charter moved the province's northern border up by 30 minutes to include the Albemarle settlements of present-day northeastern North Carolina, into which migrating Virginians had begun moving in the mid-17th century, and which was a separate administrative unit of the Carolina colony. <clears throat> More controversial from a geopolitical standpoint, however, was the southern border, which plunged two degrees southward into Spanish Florida uh, near uh, modern-day Daytona Beach, engulfing the capital of St. Augustine. So the main reason for moving the border southward was to give the Carolina colony frontage along the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, but in doing so, uh, England committed the diplomatic equivalent of adding insult to injury, uh, because not only did England refuse to accept Spanish title to the uncolonized region between Virginia and Florida, it now uh, sought to invalidate Spain's claim to the land it was already possessing, already occupying. So before the second charter was issued, the proprietors uh, based on the recommendation of, of Sir John Colleton had appointed the Barbadian planter Sir John Yeamans to serve as Carolina's governor. And Yeamans planned to use the uh, Charlestown on the Cape Fear as a base of operations for the establishment of a second settlement at Port Royal, uh, modern day Beaufort, South Carolina. So Yeamans organized a, a, an expedition which included a shipment of military arms as well as other provisions and supplies from the proprietors and departed Barbados in October of 1665. Yeamans arrived off of Cape Fear a few weeks later, but his enterprise foundered when his main supply ship struck a shoal at the mouth of the Cape Fear River, uh, breaking apart his ship, and they lost all of the cargo. So this disheartened Yeamans, and he ended up calling it quits. He packed up and sailed back to Barbados. And the setback really foreshadowed the collapse of Charlestown on the Cape Fear. Uh, ultimately, the colonists would have no one to blame uh, but themselves because they started enslaving the local Native Americans, the Cape Fear people, who, of course, retaliated against the scattered English plantations, uh, destroying most of their crops and livestock, depriving them of their means of subsistence, and the colonists began to run desperately low on, on uh, food. And by 1667, it had become increasingly clear that additional support would not be forthcoming from the proprietors. Um, after a relief ship fell prey to an enemy Dutch fleet off the coast, uh, the remaining colonists decided to abandon the Cape Fear pro project. Now, while the Cape Fear project had failed, an important development came out of it that would have a profound impact on the future colonies. Barbadians with Carolina aspirations were instrumental in shaping the type of society that would emerge in the pro uh, province by insisting on certain provisions concerning African slavery. This was especially apparent in the colony's headright system of land grants, whereby free adult colonists would receive predetermined amounts of land for the dependents that they brought with them, be they family members or indentured servants. So the Barbadians convinced the proprietors to expand the headright amenity to include enslaved Africans, thus laying the groundwork for extending the system of race-based slavery to the shores of Carolina. Whoops, wrong way. <laughs> uh, so in the mid-1660s, while the Cape Fear settlement struggled to survive, a series of calamities struck England and diverted the attention of the proprietors away from their province. First, bubonic plague struck London in 1665, killing an estimated 20% of the city's inhabitants before receding. The following year, a fire broke out on a bakery on Pudding Lane in central London and intensified into an inferno 
that would end up consuming more than 10,000 houses in London. Then the Second Anglo-Dutch War, which had broken out as a commercial conflict in 1665, took a turn for the worse two years later when a Dutch fleet surprised the English at their Medway docks, sinking several vessels and capturing the first great ship, the Royal Charles. This humiliation forced England to sue on terms more favorable, to sue for peace rather, on terms more favorable to the Dutch. Uh, the proprietor, uh, Edward Hyde, as we mentioned earlier, ended up uh, leaving the proprietorship and fleeing the country. Uh, Edward Hyde, the Earl of Clarendon, took the fall for the debacle at the Medway, was sacked as High Chancellor, and rather than hang around and endure a trial, he decided to uh, flee to the continent and would spend the rest of his life there in exile. So little wonder, with all these distractions, that the momentum for the Carolina colony had been sapped. Uh, furthermore, by 1668, George Monk, the nominal head of the proprietorship, was in poor health and had retired from public life. John Colleton of Barbados had died the previous year, and these men had been two of the project's biggest boosters. So if the colony was ever to, to become more than Albemarle County in the north, it needed new leadership. And the 47-year-old Lord Anthony Ashley Cooper stepped up and rose to the challenge, uh, giving the moribund enterprise a new lease on life, uh, with some assistance, of course, from Peter Colleton, uh, who had inherited his father's position in the proprietorship, as well as George Carteret. So Ashley, who served on England's Council of Foreign Plantations, was deeply interested in trade and New World colonies. He had even been co-owner of a small plantation on Barbados, but had since sold a share. As a student of previous colonial ventures, Ashley did his due diligence for Carolina. He specifically looked at uh, Virginia and Massachusetts, making notes of what had worked and what had not worked. So as the man who emerged as essentially the CEO of the Carolina proprietorship, Lord Ashley crafted an elaborate frame of government and promotional tract for provincial Carolina called the Fundamental Constitutions or Grand Model. In this endeavor, he had help from his personal secretary, John Locke, uh, who also served as the secretary of the proprietorship. Of course, John Locke, who was in his thirties at the time, would go on to greater fame as one of the leading uh, political philosophers of the Enlightenment. Uh, historians disagree over the magnitude of Locke's contribution. Some see him as a major player in the document's formulation, whereas others see him more as an attorney uh, who is helping a client uh, draft a legal instrument. Um, it's also likely that a few of the other proprietors had a hand uh, in its drafting as well. But regardless of, of its authorship, the first draft was completed in July of 1669, and a, a copy would accompany the first fleet that would found Charlestown in April of 1670. So Ashley and Locke's written constitution envisioned Carolina as an aristocratic republic predicated on the axiom that land confers power and that political stability derives from a proper balance in its distribution. So the document encompassed a curious complex of ideas. It was a paradox of sorts with elements of absolutism and conservatism bound up with elements of classical republicanism and liberalism. But the absolutist ideas uh, really, really outweigh uh, the liberal ones. So the authors of the fundamental constitution stated that they were devising their frame of government to be agreeable to the monarchy under which they lived while also avoiding the creation of a numerous democracy in Carolina. This was in part based on the idea that there were three uh, pure forms of government, monarchy, aristocracy, or oligarchy, and democracy, each doomed to fail on its own, but stable when mixed in the proper proportion. And Lord Ashley and Locke sought, sought to achieve the stability by rigorously organizing their society, and in effect, creating a feudalistic social order. Proprietors, of course, would occupy the top tier of the hierarchy, ruling at the pleasure of the king. 
Beneath them would be members of a hereditary nobility with titles such as landgrave and cacique. The nobility was thought necessary to attract and produce what they called men of quality and talent uh, to run the show domestically. Next came the colony's free commoners who would constitute the majority of landowners, followed by a voluntary underclass of tenants known as leap men and leap women, who like serfs would be tied to the manners of their lords, as would their children. The fundamental constitutions also created another permanent underclass, the enslaved Africans, as shown on the diagram in the previous slide. The infamous Article 101 guaranteed that free colonists would have, quote, absolute power and authority, end quote, over the Africans that they enslaved in Carolina, regardless of religion. It wouldn't matter if they were Christians, they would remain in slavery. Now, this was not only a nod to potential immigrants from Barbados, but also to the king himself. Two months before chartering Carolina back in 1663, Charles II had issued a patent to a group calling itself the Company of Royal Adventurers of England Trading into Africa, thus inaugurating England's formal entry into the transatlantic slave trade. So after that discussion, it's hard to think that there might be some progressive elements in the fundamental constitutions, uh, but there are, there are a few. Perhaps the most heralded are its provisions that promote religious, to religious tolerance and liberty of conscience. As long as one professed belief in God and acknowledged that he was to be publicly worshiped, then he or she would be welcome in Carolina and would be protected from persecution. Additionally, the proprietors prohibited double jeopardy, stipulating that no one would be tried twice for the same crime, and also decreed that voting in the colony would be done by secret ballot rather than by public affirmation. And lastly, the document's uh, classical Republican influences found clear expression in its agrarian law, which regulated the amount of land that one class could own thus preventing its engrossment in the hands of a powerful elite. So the proprietors were reserved one-fifth of Carolina for themselves and allocated another fifth to the hereditary nobility. That left the majority of the land, the remaining 60%, to the province's free commoners. So the fundamental constitutions would go through several revisions and reissuances over the years, but it would never be ratified and only partially implemented in Carolina. So in 1669, uh, Lord Ashley, who had taken the reins of the proprietorship, convinced the other five active members to match his personal contribution of 500 pounds sterling towards the cost of outfitting a new expedition to Carolina. And with that capital, they purchased Three vessels, two small warships known as frigates and a smaller, more maneuverable sloop. The larger of the frigates was rechristened Carolina. Uh, with 16 guns and a cargo capacity of about 200 tons, it became the fleet's flagship. The smaller frigate, about 100 tons, was named Port Royal after the harbor where the proprietors intended the colonists to plant their first settlement. Finally, the 30-ton sloop was named Albemarle in honor of George Monk the Duke of Albemarle. And together, these vessels and the one-year salaries of their crews represented the most sizable expenditure. The proprietors were also quite aware that by establishing a new English settlement south of Virginia, they might provoke an attack from Spain, from Spanish Florida. So they required all able-bodied all able colonists between the ages of 16, or excuse me, between the ages of 17 and 60 to serve in the provincial militia. This was uh, in the fundamental constitutions. So to arm these uh, citizen soldiers, Ashley and his colleagues spent a considerable amount of money on weapons and equipment. They purchased 200 flintlock muskets, an equal number of bandoliers, which held the ammunition, 30 barrels of gunpowder, 58 swords, 12 suits of armor, a drum, a flag for the fort, etc. So the price for these and the other stores of war was nearly 400 pounds sterling, or about 12 and a half, 12 and a half percent of the total outlay. Uh, the king himself donated 12 great guns or cannons to the cause, complete with carriages, loading implements, and a dozen shot for each. 
a little more than 100 English people from different walks of life agreed to join the expedition as colonists. The passenger manifest for the flagship Carolina alone lists the names of 92 immigrants, two thirds of whom were indentured servants or contract laborers who had agreed to serve someone for a specified time in exchange for their tickets to the new world. It was a male dominated group, this initial fleet with women representing only one sixth of the total colonists on board. Among the small contingent of women was a 19 year old indentured servant named Afra Harrelson. Hailing from Essex, uh, northeast of London, she descended from a landed family that had fallen on hard times. In Carolina, she would go on to complete her term of indenture and receive her freedom dues, which amounted to 100 acres of land. Uh, she would end up marrying a man named John Cumming, who would also sail with the First Fleet as the mate on the Carolina before eventually becoming the ship's captain himself. Uh, the couple would end up amassing a sizable estate and would eventually acquire indentured servants of their own. So the proprietors appointed uh, Joseph West to serve as the expedition's commander in chief for the first leg of the voyage, which would end when the fleet reached Barbados. The proprietors had specifically sent the first fleet down to Barbados. They wanted it to transit via Barbados so that they could pick up additional Barbadians and uh, get a sense of what was happening on Barbados uh, in terms of the sugar industry. And so uh, Joseph West had, had previous experience as a naval officer, having served as a lieutenant under James Carteret, son of the proprietor George Carteret, during the Second Anglo-Dutch War. West was a, a pious and dependable man uh, who would later rise to the governorship of Carolina becoming its second and fourth chief executives. Off the coast of Kent, England, lies a, a, broad, a broad sand bank called the Downs, um, or excuse me, called the Goodwin Sands, rather. Um, it creates a protected roadstead or a large sheltered anchorage that's known as the Downs. And during the age of sail, vessels coming and going from London use the Downs as a staging area because the Thames would usually be way too crowded. In August of 1669, the first fleet was already riding at anchor off the coast of Kent, awaiting a favorable wind. So the three vessels launched from the Downs around the middle of August and made an unscheduled stop at Falmouth in Cornwall, which was it was either the first or last port on the English Channel, depending on which way you were going. Um, the purpose of this visit was likely to take on additional provisions because the captain of the Carolina had written the proprietors uh, just before the fleet departed uh, to note that provisions had been far spent, having been consumed during delays caused by, quote, the common inconveniences incident to ships outward bound, end quote. By the mid-17th century, Falmouth had emerged as a major vittling port where vessels could put in for biscuit and beer. This is a rep rep uh, representation or illustration of the port in the late 1500s, uh, showing Pendennis Castle inside the red oval at the top. By the time of the first fleet's arrival in 1669, the town had grown significantly uh, with the area south of the castle abounding with inns, alehouses, and breweries. Sounds like my kind of town. All right, so next Commander West led the fleet to Kinsale in Southern Ireland where Lord Ashley had arranged for him to pick up some additional indentured servants. Uh, in the 17th century, Kinsale was the main port of embarkation for contract laborers coming out of Ireland. Well, unfortunately for West, uh, the venture backfired in achieving the opposite result, actually. A frustrated West later complained that the whole West had been, the whole endeavor rather, had been a colossal waste of time and money. Uh, not only did they find no new recruits in Ireland, but a few indentured servants out of England actually made it ashore and disappeared into the countryside. The agent that Lord Ashley had employed to procure indentured servants explained that the Irish people were reluctant to go to Carolina, given the abuses that many of their countrymen had already suffered in the Caribbean, 
this was likely a, a reference to the English practice of sending defeated Irish soldiers and political prisoners to the West Indian islands as forced laborers. So the fleet departed Ireland in mid-September 1669 and likely followed the safest route to the West Indies, which would have likely taken it, taken it south uh, beyond the Canaries to the Cape Verde chain off the coast of West Africa before swinging west with the trade winds into the Southern Caribbean. In the letter, in the letter that uh, Commander Joseph West wrote to Lord Ashley upon reaching Barbados, uh, he did not mention stopping anywhere between Ireland and the West Indies. The fleet, however, may have put in at Cape Verde for wooden water, it was a common occurrence. Uh, it was considered a neutral point, a neutral port rather, plus uh, England was allied with Portugal, the country that controlled it. Uh, the Carolina and the Port Royal uh, reached Barbados in October of 1669. The Albemarle, which had fallen behind the frigates, arrived three days later. On Barbados, Joseph West turned over senior command uh, to Sir John Yeamans, the same John Yeamans who had abandoned uh, Cape Fear settlement earlier. Uh, proprietors had sent him a blank commission uh, for Carolina's governorship again. West then busied himself with procuring cotton and indigo seeds, as well as ginger roots, sugar canes, and olive tree saplings uh, for trial once the uh, fleet reached Carolina. Again, experimenting, looking for that cash crop that they could find that would make uh, Carolina the next Barbados was the hope. While anchored off the island, the fleet suffered its first casualty, the sloop. Albemarle fell victim to high winds, which snapped its cables and sent it crashing into the coral limestone rocks on November 2nd, 1669. The expedition's leaders then hired a local sloop to replace to replace the three brothers, or to replace the Albemarle, rather. And the replacement sloop was called Three Brothers, named after its owners, the Colleton siblings, which included the proprietor Peter and his young, younger brothers, Thomas and James. In addition to Sir John Yeamans, a small but indeterminate number of Barbadians also joined the expedition. According to one contemporary source, the island contingent included both men and women, some of whom may have been enslaved Africans. Weighing anchor from Barbados in late November, the flotilla encountered rough seas but found safe harbor at Nevis. There a young surgeon named Henry Woodward threw in with the enterprise. He had recently lived among the native people of the Port Royal area as part of a culture exchange arrangement before being captured by the Spanish and subsequently released by English pirates who sacked St. Augustine, Florida in 1668. Uh, Woodward would go on to become the colony's principal interpreter and agent of the Indian trade, as the English referred to the trade with Native Americans. So fair skies allowed the fleet to resume its journey a few days later, a few days rather after putting in at Nevis. But if the colonists thought that they had endured the, the worst of it, they were sadly wrong uh, because as they were navigating the multicolored waters uh, in the Northern Caribbean rim, a violent gale struck the fleet and scattered the hapless vessels. Uh, the flagship Carolina sustained damage to its stern and was blown all the way uh, to Bermuda uh, with its stern smashed in. The three brothers also survived and uh, with fierce winds driving it all the way up to Virginia. The Port Royal, however, wrecked off the Abacos in the Bahamas with 37 passengers and seven crewmen on board. Uh, they were able to use the vessel's launch to get safely ashore, but the five cannon carriages that the frigate was carrying in its hold were lost. Uh, this would mean that the colonists would only be able to mount uh, seven of the 12 pieces of artillery that the king granted them when they finally reached the mainland. While a few of the Port Royal survivors secured passage to Bermuda and possibly rejoined the expedition, the majority of them, Joseph West later reported, abandoned the venture and remained in the Bahamas. So while West saw to the repair and refitting of the flagship in Bermuda, Sir John Yeamans again decided with, to withdraw from the expedition claiming that he was required to return to Barbados to serve as a commissioner in some territorial negotiations 
with the French over the island of, of St. Kitts. Yet before departing, Yemen selected the elderly Bermudian William Sale to replace him as governor of Carolina. Sale was a logical choice given his previous executive experience. Uh, he had not only led a group of Puritans who colonized the Bahamian island of Eleuthera in 1648, but he also served two terms as governor of Bermuda. Uh, three additional people boarded the Carolina and Bermuda, but not of their own free will. Uh, they were not English colonists hoping to find a better life on the mainland. No, uh, they were considered by the laws of their age to be the legal property of Governor William Sale. Uh, we do not know their African names, only the English, uh, only the English ones imposed upon them, uh, John Elizabeth and John Jr. Um, they were likely a family with the parents having met in the New World after they were enslaved, and, and Governor Sale would receive 350 acres of land for them per the proprietary head right system. So repaired and refitted, the uh, Carolina unfurled its sails on the 26th of February, 1670, and headed west toward Port Royal with a newly acquired Bermudian shallop, a small boat in tow. More than 100 miles off course, the Carolina made landfall at Bulls Bay near modern-day Allendale, South Carolina in mid-March. There, the colonists traded with the native Seawee people who would go on to become allies of English Carolina. And news of the newcomer's arrival soon reached the leader of the Kiowa, a Kusabo people whose domain straddled the river now known as the Ashley, uh, which prompted him to travel north to Siwi to meet with the English. So the cacique, as the colonists uh, referred to the leader of the Kiowa, was no stranger to the English. Uh, he and his people had traded with the Barbadians at Charlestown on the Cape Fear. Uh, fearful of the slave trading Westo, a belligerent group of Native Americans based on the Savannah River, the cacique of the Kiowa made a strategic calculation. He invited the English to settle among his people. The Westo, who possessed European firearms, had recently raided as far as Kiowa, and the cacique hoped to the cacique rather hoped to secure a well-armed ally that would dissuade the Westo from further in, incursions. Uh, Port Royal, the cacique cautioned, was a riskier choice because the Westo had recently attacked there burning houses and killing inhabitants. So the saga of the Westo really exemplifies the pressures that European colonization put on certain indigenous peoples. Anthropologists believe that the Westo were originally Erie people who once lived on the southern shore of their eponymous lake. Uh, they were forced out by the Iroquois who were trying to monopolize the fur trade during the Beaver Wars of the 1650s. A large group of Erie would end up migrating southward to the back country of Virginia, where they formed a partnership with the Virginia colonists, whereby uh, they agreed to supply captive Native Americans, whom the Virginians would then enslave in exchange for uh, European firearms and manufactured goods. Uh, so to avoid provoking indigenous groups that were on good terms with the Virginia colony, uh, the Erie, uh, soon to become known as the Westo, would move uh, southward again and had taken up residence on the Savannah River by around the year 1660. Um, from their, their town near modern day Augusta, Georgia, they launched slaving raids against native peoples of the Southeast. Um, the name Westo was given to uh, this migratory group of Erie by the Kusabo peoples of what is now the South Carolina Low Country. So a few years after Charlestown's founding, uh, Henry Woodward, who we just discussed, would broker a trade uh, arrangement or agreement with the Westo, and the Carolina colony would then replace Virginia as their primary market until they were undercut by the Savannah people, who not only uh, took over the trade in the year uh, 1680, but also essentially eradicated the Westo in the process. So from Seawee, the colonists sailed south to their intended harbor. Uh, the cacique of the Kiowa accompanied them to serve as an interpreter, as one of the colonists lauded him as a great linguist. At Port Royal, uh, local Native Americans confirmed a recent Westo attack, which in part persuaded Governor Sale to accept the Kiowa offer. Thus, in April of 1670, the colonists selected the site for their first settlement. 
a secluded moss-draped bluff overlooking the marshes on the west side of the river. They initially called Kiowa, later the Ashley. But I see we're at a 1255, so we'll leave that subject for another time. Um, Catherine, I'll turn it back over to you for uh, questions. Yes. So first off, thank you, John. That was great. I um I was I was thinking as you were talking about some of the things, um, the documents that you showed. Um, oh, and while I ask my own questions, um, please feel free to um to write something in the chat if you have questions. But I was wondering if you could let us know where those the fundamental constitution's handwritten document and the document that had the um the weapons uh where do the where are those housed do you know so the um document that showed the weapons on it is a transcription that one of our volunteers uh did for us oh cool okay uh, and so I would have to check my notes on the repository where the fundamental constitutions are. Right. Okay. My first offhand statement would be the British Museum, but I'd have to check. Yeah. I don't it, know that offhand. It'd be really I don't interesting. Recall. It'd be interesting to know. I've seen it in print form, but never right. um never the original. So I'm kind of interested in that. Um, there may be, and there may be a copy of it, because there's several copies because it was reissued several times. Uh, there may be a copy of it at the South Carolina S State Archives in Columbia. But oh, um, Virginia again. Ellison just chimed in. She said the Charleston Library Society has the fundamental constitution here locally. Um, mm. So that would be interesting to see as well. Um, so interesting. I love, we love kind of taking a look at the original things. Um, I wanted to um, mention before uh, we see any any questions to um, to share, um, I did want to just go through the um, the guides that I have um, so far. Alice Gordon. Hi, Miss Alice. Faith Rose, Gloria Bailey, Jack Bowman, Julia Fox, Leighton Register, Lisa Harper, Bresney, Mary Helen Dantzler, Meryl Troxell, Paul Hedden, Dan Sellers, Sherry Zabinski, Susan Epstein, and um, Skip Evans, um, as well as Dan Grobel. Um, if there's anybody who I did not call out, um, either put it in the chat or, um, or email me. Oh, Lindsay Dishman, great. Um, and Lacey, I got you. Um, so that is wonderful. Um, anybody else just email me. Um, oh, Jack Kelly. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody else? No. All right. So I don't know if we've got any other questions. I will just say that I think... Um, Somebody needs to make a movie about Henry Woodward because he was he was like the Indiana Jones of the of the Carolina <laughs> colony, I think. Um, so so crazy. What an adventurous life. Yeah, he's constantly getting captured and escaping and talking to people and learning new languages and just being a, went to Westro Town. I know, like he's a he's a tough guy. 74? Um. But yeah, there, somebody wrote a book about him and I haven't read it yet. It's called, um, oh shoot, I've got it on the shelf over there. It's like a a fictional account of- Yeah, I know what you're Harry talking Hoover. about. Yeah, it's got a cardinal on the cover. <laughs> I can't remember the name of it. But um, but at any rate, um, guys, thank you so much for coming. This was really, really helpful. And I hope everybody comes back um, next week, we're going to be talking with um, John Marcou about um, indigenous people in this area. And, and John Hyatt already touched on some of it, but I think the landscape of the indigenous folks who are here is really instructive when we're trying to learn about um, early Carolina. So um, 
Do you have that magnifying glass? And yeah. everybody is sort of saying, thank you, thank you. They learned so much mm -hmm. and such a great talk, John Hyatt. So we do thank have- Thank you. This. Thank you all for tuning in and- Yeah, and indulging come out to Charlestown <laughs> Landing and see him in, in, um, in person. I'm not as wooden in person. <laughs> a little more, a little more, a little more personality. Information here. Absolutely John is great. Well, great. that was a lot of fun. That really was. Really it's enjoyed good. it. We loved it at the old exchange building. Great. Well, thank you. So glad you made it, Tony. And um, thanks to everybody. And we'll we'll see you next week. All right. Take care. Thank you. Cheers, Bye. everybody. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Well, that was fun. We